Hi, uh, so I'm Sushma. I am a PhD student at Iowa State University, and today I will talk to you about discovering the gatekeepers of the nucleus in approximate labeling approach. First, let me tell you about malaria. Every two minutes, there is a child in this world who dies of malaria. And as you can see from this map, there are a lot more places in the world where malaria hasn't been eradicated yet. So this is a WHO report of 2019 showing the number of cases throughout the world in 2018. The different colors that you can see here indicate the number of uh, cases per 100,000 people. And as you can see, most of these cases are from the African region alone. What is worse is that pregnant women and children are the most vulnerable of all the people who get malaria. You might think, well, don't we have drugs for malaria already? We do, but there is no vaccine available for malaria yet. And even the drugs that are being given right now, there are a lot of parasites that are developing resistance to these drugs. So it's absolutely important for us to study this parasite that is causing this disease in order to develop a vaccine. So why is it so difficult to develop a vaccine in the first place? That is because the malarial parasite Plasmodium has a very complex life cycle. As you can see in this image here, it has two different hosts, the mosquito and humans. It goes from mosquito to humans when the mosquito takes a blood meal. And the parasites that are, that are in the mosquito travel to the human liver as porosite. Another thing you can notice here is these parasites go through different life cycle stages. So it's not that it stays the same way. It's difficult to develop a vaccine because it keeps changing its form. So first, it's when they are released uh, into the human body, they infect liver cells and then they enter the bloodstream as a mirror one. They then turn into an immature trophozoite state, which is the ring state. This develops into a mature trophozoite and then further becomes a schizom. The other part the parasite can take is becoming a gametocyte, which is the sexual stage of it. And this continues to the mosquito and the life cycle goes on. The blood stage or parasites anyhow, break out from the red blood cell and then go on to uh, infect more and more red blood cells. So this is how the clinical symptoms of malaria are seen. And a lot of the drugs and diagnostic tests are aimed at this particular stage of the parasite. Why am I talking to you about malaria when I said I was going to talk to you about the gatekeepers of nucleus? Because we are trying to understand what are the gatekeepers of the nucleus in this parasite so that we can finally find good targets for vaccines. So let me talk to you a little bit about nuclear membranes and nuclear pores and what they are. This is a typical uh, merozoite, a plasmodium parasite that I showed you earlier. You know that every eukaryotic cell has a nucleus, right? So this is the nucleus and the nuclear membrane is not intact. It has pores on it to allow transport between the cytoplasm and the nucleus. So these pores are not alone, they are guarded by these protein complexes, which are huge megadalton complexes, called nuclear pore complexes. They have about 30 different proteins called nukes, and they have multiple copies of these nukes. So these nukes are the ones that decide what needs to move in and out of the nucleus, but that's not the only function they have. They also have other functions, such as holding the structure of the nuclear membrane, gene expression, cell signaling, transcriptional regulation, and signaling. So you can see that the nuclear pore complex has a lot of important functions that if we could target in this parasite, could probably kill it. And this is why we're interested in studying them. Looking closely at the nuclear pore complex, this is how the basic structure of it looks like. I told you that it has a number of different nukes or nuclear pore proteins. Some different types of those are the inner ring nooks. So this is the cytoplasmic side and the basket is the nuclear side. So the pore sits in between the pore, 
So the nuclear pore complex sits inside the pore and has the central F G nook. F G nooks are nothing but proteins that have phenyl alanine and glycine repeats, and these are extremely important because they have these green structures which are nothing but the FG, the phenyl alanine and glycine amino acids just into the center channel in a way that they directly interact with whatever cargo is moving in and out. So it seems important that because these interact with whatever cargo is moving in and out, they should be easy to target. And as you can see here, we've shown the different nooks, like I said, the nuclear core proteins in these plants and vertebrates. One important point to consider here is that all these proteins across these three categories are conserved. So they have the same sequence or st structural composition. But in plasmodium that we are interested in, none of this is conserved. And I need to remind you here that plasmodium is also a eukaryote. But despite conservation across all these eukaryotes, there is absolutely no sequence or structural conservation in plasmodium. It is weird, yes, and we haven't been able to figure this out as well. And we're trying to see why this evolution has happened and why there is this evolutionary, evolutionary divergent thing that is being uh, seen here. Another demonstration of this, people have studied for decades the human fibroblast nucleus, the endonuclear pore, dictocelium, xenopus. All of this have, have been completely studied and the structures are easily available, but there is absolutely no structure available for plasmodium, which we know is a very deadly plasmodium. So the only piece of information available is uh, from this previous work that has identified five of these FG nodes. I said, like I said, FG are these repeats. And as you can see, it was pretty simple to find these just using a bioinformatics approach. Uh, the protein has a bunch of these FG repeats in the protein. This is one of the proteins that is into the center, central channel. So the five uh, that I have indicated here are the five known FG nodes. Uh, that was our only starting point. But ahead from this, we had no other way we could find any more proteins. And like I said, there are 30. So there, there was a lot of work to be done. So seeing no other way out, we decided to uh, go ahead with this approach called proximity labeling. Now I'm not sure uh, if any of you and how many of you have heard of this approach, but it's a really cool approach because what it does is it uses one known protein called a bait protein, and it helps in identifying proteins that are close by or proximal proteins. So if you see here, this, this figure shows, so if this is the bait protein, this is the bio ID is basically biotin ligase, which is an enzyme, which biotinylates nearby proteins in the presence of biotin. So if this is my bit A and I have a uh, bait protein attached to it, something that is known, and these are the non-proximal and proximal proteins, it biotinylates only the proximal protein. And when we lyse these cells, denature them and do an affinity capture using streptavidin, because biotin streptavidin is very strong, we can actually pull down these proteins that actually interact with our bait protein and identify what these are using mass spec. So since we knew five of the FG nodes, we use those as our base protein, as our starting point to actually fish out the other proteins which are nearby them. And since they're supposed to be in one nuclear pore complex, we thought this would work best. Now there's not just one version of the bio ID. So the biotin ligase was the original version created by Kyle Drew. The second version was the BioID2, which was a more selective targeting version. It was a manipulation of the original enzyme. Uh, the linker BioID2 uh, was a enzyme with a linker attached to it, which is a, a repeat of GGGGS, just to increase the labeling radius. It's like using a longer fishing rod. And the last one was the turbo ID, which was really good in a way that but well, while BioID took 18 hours to do this to biotinylate protein, TurboID did this in 10 minutes. This was a mutated version of previous enzymes and was found to be much, much better. 
what we did was we took all of these available versions and we fused our one protein to it. And we made these plasmids with the BioID version. And then what we do is we transfer these into our parasites and inject the parasites into the mouse because that's where also in the case of humans, we use mouse as model system. And once injected into the mouse, they grow and we use uh, the mouse blood. Uh, Lysa to saponin, extract the proteins and do a mass spec. The other thing we do is we make blood smears to look at these proteins directly under a fluorescence microscope or uh, by other immunofluorescence methods. As you can see, our first set of results, uh, while we compared one of the proteins, we tagged one of our proteins with the different versions here, BioRD2, Linker, Turbo, Mini Turbo, and another control. And what you're seeing here, so the first panel is a wild type parasite, and the blue is the apple sitting the nucleus. And as you know, uh, the red blood cell does not have a nucleus. So the stain that we see is coming from the parasite alone. So uh, the wild type has no red signal, which is showing the protein that we have put in. And we observed that BioID and the other versions of BioID did not work well for us. But the only version that worked great was the Turbo ID version. And like I said, we were targeting nuclear core protein. So you can see a clear staining around the periphery of the nucleus. And that is what we should be getting. So we decided Turbo ID was the way to go. And so we looked at the smears first and then decided to pull down these proteins that were actually getting identified using this and see what these proteins are. Uh, how we did this was when we do a mass spec, we usually get a lot of proteins. And this is because proteins are moving in and out of this complex. So literally every protein that is moving across is getting biotinated. So we had to go through a process of listing, short, uh, making the short list of these proteins. So when we got data from MassPet, we first took a triplicate sample, and then we refined this using annotations to PlasmoDB. So PlasmoDB is our database where all the Plasmodium genes are put up and we have annotations for them. We then look for the presence of transmembrane domain. Because this is in the nuclear membrane, it's most probable to be a nuclear core protein if it has a transmembrane domain. So that's what we look for. And then the third thing we look for is for the phenotype. Is this an essential protein for the parasite? If it's an essential protein, it is most likely to be a part of this complex, which is, which is absolutely essential for the parasite. And as a last step, we also shortlisted based on the NSAF values that we get from the mass spec, which is the abundance of the protein, because the closer the protein is, the more it's getting back in later. And we picked up two such proteins and tagged them with fluorescent markers for studying the localization. Here I'm showing you two such proteins, uh, which were identified through mass spec. Again, if you see here, this is a wild type with no signal in near the, near the nuclear periphery. And you see our two proteins, uh, which we identified, have clear signal near the nuclear periphery. And they could very well be very good candidates for being nuclear core protein. Now there is a lot of work to be done, but the first step was identifying what these are, because once we, if we don't even know what the components of the complex are, we will never know how important they are and what they actually do. So we have a couple more such proteins, which we are uh, currently looking at, and we are also trying to study their function. It's important to point out that the usual knockout systems in other uh, models don't work with plasmodium. There is no RNAi with uh, plasmodium. It does not work. So it's a little tricky, uh, but we're trying to find our way around it. As a conclusion, we did a comparative study to identify the nuclear core proteins of plasmodium, which is a malaria parasite. And we showed that one of the versions of the BioID system, Turbo ID, was the best of those. We've made use of this to identify two uh, novel genomes for this uh, parasite, Plasmodium burgii, and we have shown that they localize to the nuclear periphery. I would like to thank my uh, PI, Dr. Gunnar Meyer, and the other lab that I work with, Dr. Josh Beck, 
members of your lab and our proteomics lab in UCLA, which did most of the mass tech analysis. And then I, a big thank you to Bioroom for being present. My research, I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you.